Well, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you to Lance for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I similarly heard your name multiple, multiple times. It's such a pleasure to speak here. And it was funny because I had an entirely different talk planned for this with slides and everything. I emailed Lance yesterday. And then I prayed this morning, as I do, and uh, a different message came to me. And this real talk is, is hopefully actually about all of you, and not about me, and not even about my story, but about God's story, and about what he wants you to hear today. And it's actually a perfect follow-up to Mike's, because he kind of seeded the problem, right? That we, we can't think of churches in those four walls. We have to think much bigger. Uh, and, and this is almost like the how-to. Okay, what does that look like um, for all of us? And a shout out to, is anyone here from Pacifica in the back? Woohoo! Shout out, we got it. some people here, from, I heard that. Um, so I, I live in Pacifica, I have three wonderful kids, and one of my daughters is here, Amber. Um, teenagers and wonderful husband, we live on the coast in Pacifica. I am the director of documentation at, senior director of documentation at Salesforce in their technology organization. Started there 11 years ago. Uh, and now I've, I've had the opportunity of, of managing dozens of engineers and, and technical writers, which is really fun, as well as uh, kind of lifting up the people of faith, of all faiths, actually, at Salesforce. So I'll talk about that. And I'm speaking just from my story. I'm not a spokesperson for Salesforce. This is not um, anything official. It's just kind of my story of, of finding faith, which I just became a Christian a little over two years ago. So. Let me, so praise God for that. And let's just back up a little bit on how all of this kind of has happened. As I said, I think today is really about all of you. And whether you are yourself exploring faith, um, maybe you've grown up Christian, but it, you haven't had that, uh, you know, strong commitment yourself, or maybe you are a, a full believer and you want to know how to apply that, I, I hope this message is for all of you. And it's really about courage. What, what are the next steps that we can take in our life? What are the how-tos? And I'll, let me just bring you to a moment. Uh, I had just converted. I had just uh, started a, a role at Salesforce. So I had been there for many years. I had been there for about seven years as a technology leader building my credibility. Uh, left for a couple years, that's when I found faith, and I'll tell you about that. But I, I had come back, and I hadn't quite come out as a Christian yet, not fully. And I was in a team meeting, there was about 10 of us sitting around a circle, and we were doing a team building activity, as you do. And the topic came up, um, if you had two extra hours in your day, what would you do with it? And I was, I was this new believer. I was on fire. There was nothing I wanted to do more than read the Bible at that time. I mean, that was the first thing that came to my mind. If I had two extra hours in the day, what would I do? It was one answer to that. I would read the Bible. And then I began this angst. Can I say that? I couldn't say that. They don't even know I'm, they're going to think I'm crazy. I can't say that. But, but now I, I am accountable <laughs> to say that because there really is a God. And this conversation started to go around the room, and people were sharing. And I thought, oh my gosh, I got I to, is this my moment to speak up? And I, my heart was racing, and my palms were sweaty. And it came to me, and they said, what would you do if you had two extra hours? And I said, I took a deep breath, and I said, I would go hiking. <laughs> And my heart broke in that moment that I had an opportunity to stand up for this Jesus that I did believe in, and I messed it up. I backed out. I was not courageous. And the next day, uh, I, I, you know, I, I felt awful, and I, I apologized to God, and of course, he forgave me. And, and uh, you know, I, I had the next decision, and it was, do I wear my cross? To work. So these were baby steps decisions. And the first cross I wore looked like a flower because then I could get by. Maybe some people would just think it's a flower. 
and, uh, you know, and, and let's test the waters. Let's see if anybody hates me or, you know, thinks bad things of me. And nothing happened. Nobody said any. In fact, one person came up to me and said, oh, is that a cross? That's pretty. Are you Christian? I'm Christian. And it started this beautiful conversation, and it was baby steps to kind of embolden me um, to the point where I met with this Amanda. So just so you know, uh, this has all happened in my life through baby steps, baby steps, many of which I have failed and tried again, and God always forgave me. So why was I such a late-in-life convert? So, I mean, just two years ago. I was, a, I was not only agnostic, but I was a huge skeptic. I was pretty anti-Christian, I would say, and anti-religious. Where did that come from? So I grew up in a, a little town called Layton, Utah, which was gorgeous. Anyone been to Utah? I mean, one of the prettiest places on the planet. Opened my front door to the Rocky Mountains. Gorgeous. Um, but Layton, Utah at the time was 95% Mormon. And we were not Mormon. We were sort of nothing. I mean, I kind of went to a Protestant church a couple times as a toddler, and they, my parents had some falling out. We just were not religious. So at any given year, I was the only non-Mormon in my entire class. And that was my entire childhood like that. So I felt like an outsider, and I really hated that. And I realized that, you know, and I started to build this wall against religion. And I got really good at defending why I did not want to be that and why I was different. Um, but I had to find something to follow. And I, I, luckily, I found that accomplishment got a lot of kudos. Grades got a lot of kudos. And, and that sort of became my god. And I pursued success. And, and I was this straight-A student. I remember in fifth grade, I had straight A's, and my teacher handed out a list of 15 extra credit assignments. And for no reason whatsoever, I did all 15 of them, including building a replica of Independence Hall. And my teacher eventually called my parents and asked me to stop. <laughs> so I was an over overachiever for no reason, except that I got purpose out of that and meaning. And that actually worked really well all through life, pursuing that purpose, that um, accomplishment, um, until a few years ago. So what happened was I'd achieved everything. You know, I have a wonderful husband, house by the beach, three kids, great job, literally in a tower in San Francisco. But I was missing something. And I didn't know what that was. I thought it was, uh, you know, I tried volunteering or exercise. Nothing really filled that void. And I had this image come to me. I didn't believe in images, but I still had an image of speaking, kind of like this. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm supposed to be a trainer. You know, I could teach leadership, and that would be really fulfilling. I could help people. And so against a lot of advice, I quit my very good job uh, and pursued this new career, which you know, was really exciting at first. And I was traveling around the world, and attendees would say, oh, that changed my life. It was a you know, great class. And I, and I was really frustrated to find, probably not to your surprise, to my surprise, that did not fill the void. Uh, and that was really scary, because at that point, that was my last option. I had no idea what else would fill this void. And then... God gave me the gift of failure in that moment. Not only was I starting to realize I may have made a terrible mistake with my career, but I began to fail at that career. So suddenly, I had a sales quota. And I was asked to not just teach these classes, but sell them. And it turns out I'm really bad at sales. <laughs> Anyone do sales in here? It's not easy, is it? And it's often not in your control. I don't know. I, I could, in everything else in life, I could just work harder. I could, you know, study longer. I could um, practice more. But in this case, no matter how many calls I made, no matter how many um, presentations I made, I couldn't do this thing. And I began to fail miserably. And I remember I was sitting in a hotel room in Vienna, Virginia, by myself. 
in the dark, missing my family. And I got another email from a client who said, I'm not interested. So I made this big mistake, and I knew it. And I had no idea how to get out of it. And I said out loud in that moment to nobody whatsoever, and I didn't know it was a prayer, but I think it was, um, I give up. I wasn't suicidal. I wasn't giving up on life. But I gave up on my ability to fix it. And I'd never said that before. And some really interesting things happened and happen when we say, I give up. And I want, as you hear kind of more of this story, I want you to think about what resonates with you. Which piece of this resonates with you? Which person, which character in this story resonates with you? Because I think there's different stages of, of this process for people. But that was stage one for me, was giving up my desire to lead my life. So I said that. And something also was happening at the same time, which was my son had, was, was sick, and we weren't able to find a specialist for him. And the next day, after I said this, I give up, I got an email from this, a specialist, and he said, I can help your son. And something told me to trust him. And he sent this big information packet, and in the middle of this information packet was a very peculiar sentence, and it was about God in a medical information packet. He was saying, you know, I, I believe that surrounding us is, is a God who can also help in our healing, essentially. And that sentence, which normally would have been very offensive to me, was beautiful. The word God was beautiful to me, and I was drawn to it. And then, weirdly, suddenly, I wanted to listen to Christian music. <laughs> but don't tell anybody. I put on my headphones, and I, I was very secretive about it, and it was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. And I was crying, and I was thinking, for some reason, truth. Truth was the word I kept hearing. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then I had the craziest desire. I, I thought of an old friend of mine. He was my kid's old karate teacher from years ago, and he popped to mind. And I remembered, oh, he goes to church. And I suddenly pulled out my phone, and before I could really think about it, I just texted him, and I said, can I go to church with you? <laughs> and I was like, what am I doing? This is insane. I don't go to church. I don't listen to Christian music. I don't, I, this is not me. But I was just sort of obeying whatever was happening. And I, he, said, he said, no. No, he said, yes. He said, <laughs> He said yes, and I went to church, and it was this like, incredible experience. I was like, what is happening? What is this? It was beautiful. Whatever they were saying was beautiful. And there were these two people next to me, and, and they prayed over me. They, they said, I pray that God will be with you. I'm like, what is happening? And I went to my car and kind of dusted off my tears, and I thought, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> well, I don't know what's going on here, but I, I flew to uh, Austin, Texas, which was another business program I had, and I was, I was in the hotel room, this is the next day, and I get a text from this karate teacher, and he says this, Sue, I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal himself to you today. I was like, wow. I didn't actually know what that meant. <laughs> But I knew that it was kind. I knew that he had stopped what he was doing to send me a prayer. And I knew that it was beautiful. And I just looked at it. I sat on the bed in my kind of despair of what I had done with my life and where I was going, and I just accepted it, accepted the gift of this prayer. One hour later, the phone rang. It wasn't God, no. <laughs> Not exactly. It was my Aunt Jean. And we didn't talk about faith in my family. Nobody really talked about religion. And she said, Sue, this is going to sound weird, but I'm supposed to call you right now. 
and tell you about God. <laughs> but thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean. And I, it was too much. It was too much to throw away. And I sat there and I listened. And it was the most beautiful conversation I had ever had in my life. It was simply God in her life what God had done for her and what Jesus had done for her and how uh, believing had lifted her. And I knew, about 20 minutes into it, I knew that this was the most important moment of my life. And I had to make a decision after this call. And I said to her, I took a deep breath. And I said, Jean, I believe you. And I hung up the phone and... You know, the first feeling I had, uh, this realization, I mean, like, I don't know, are there any other kind of later in life converts here? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, this sudden realization, there is a God. Like, just imagine that for a moment. If you've grown up, it's hard to imagine if you've grown up with Christianity, but this, like, knock over the head, you know, it's almost like, like Saul on the road to Damascus, you know, just like almost blinding was this moment for me. Um, there is a God. And he's been here the whole time as I pushed him away and I ignored him and I kind of kicked him to the curb. He'd been there. And I kind of fell to my knees in utter sadness, actually, was the first real feeling. I had to kind of like think about that life, that life that he gave me, this home he had built for me. Think of your, think of, if you may have had an incredible parent. If you didn't, maybe your, your friend's parents were just incredible. They opened their home to you. They fed you. They loved you. And imagine just not even thanking them, not even acknowledging them. That's the realization I had. And uh, it, was, it was devastating, actually. It was three hours of, of repentance and acknowledging that I had that, that this was real and I had ignored it. And then my first prayer came to me at that moment. And it was two words. Does anyone want to guess? What was it? God help me. Thank you. These are all really good. Anyone else? I surrender. I surrender. A version of that. It was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, repentance. So it's like surrender first, right? I give up. And then it's I'm sorry. And then I texted this karate teacher and I said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what just happened. And he said three things. He said, praise God. And he said, get a Bible. And he said, read John. And I did that. And I fell in love with this Jesus person. And I flew home a couple days later. I stumbled into this church and I said the messiest prayer of, um, acceptance, saying, you know, God, I want, I want you to lead my life. I want Jesus to lead my life. I do not want to lead this thing. I am not good at it. And I acknowledge that Jesus died for me, that he came here and he gave his life for me, for me no matter what, no matter what I did to him. And, and that was it. And I thought, wow, so okay, now what? <laughs> and I went through a period of study and kind of wrestling, and, um, but I was very clear that this was true. I mean, no, you don't get a gift like that, a gift of revelation like that, and throw it away. So I knew that it was true. I just had to kind of figure out how to work this into my life. So that was sort of the next step in this process. And I began to pray. And I would receive. I would receive guidance. I'd never had this in my life. It's very normal probably for some people, but um, I would ask, like, what, what do I do now? Who, who do I talk to? What am I supposed to do? And it became very clear that I was to be bold, that in fact, my whole life had been training, that it wasn't training just for work, that it was for a much bigger purpose, and that he expected much. To whom much is given, much will be expected. And one of the gifts he gave me, he, he repaired a lot of relationships in my life. I was just so overflowing with love. I was calling people and loving them and apologizing. And relationships that would have taken years of therapy were just totally healed overnight. All these amazing things. And one of the gifts he gave me also was an offer to come back to Salesforce very shortly after. Total miracle. 
Um, and once I was there, I knew that I had to be bold. And it was scary. Like I said, that you know, picture that, that conference room conversation. Like, Christianity is not popular in Silicon Valley. It is not cool. It's not seen that way. There's a lot of stigma. I think it's less than we think, but we can't ignore that. At least we assume it's there. And so I was really scared, actually. But that first day, my first day back on the job, I opened my laptop. God had already told me what I was supposed to do. And I typed on our social media, would anybody like to pray with me? <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, God. I would not, that is not something I would normally have done. Um, I had a reputation to maintain. And... And I did that, and, and it took a, a while. It took a couple weeks, but then Amanda, she wrote back, and she said, I would love to pray with you. So it was just two of us. It was two of us in a conference room, this big empty conference room with glass walls, and we prayed. And in that moment, God broke through, and, and I could have both, I realized. And then he just blessed it. He blessed that step of faith. He said, um, you know, the next week we had four and five and ten, and there's almost 400 now all across the world, and from Mexico to Brazil to Singapore. And then shortly after that formed, and we meet regularly for devotionals and prayer, and, and it's, it's, it's almost like you can think of a meditation group, you know, that, that exists at, at companies. This is, is similar. We get encouragement and fellowship. And then, I, you know, I started to talk to people of all faiths, and I said, you know what? I feel scared sometimes. To, to talk about faith, and they said, so do I. And so we all kind of got together and we worked with our um, executives and together formed this group called Faith Force, which is our faith diversity group. And that's been an, um, just an explosive success from you know, just a handful of us to now 1,600 in countries all over the world. Um, it's the fastest growing employee relation group, uh, resource group in Salesforce history. And there's a pent-up need for faith, for faith discussions of all kinds. And, and I regularly get to talk to people and say, what's your faith background? And we have enormous celebrations for all the different faith backgrounds. And it's not to say that all the faiths are the same. We're not homogenizing faith. It's really clear about just honoring the distinctions and honoring the traditions. That's what that group is about. It's about philanthropy and um, education and celebration. And that's it. Those are the, what it's about. What it's not about is politics or proselytizing. This is not about actually forcing the different groups to change their mind or think differently. It's just honoring. It's just honoring and loving. Love your neighbor. That's what this is. But then they, there's also different fellowship groups. There's, you know, Jewish group and, and so forth that, that can meet and encourage each other. And they have really different goals and really different purposes. And, and that's been huge for, um, for Salesforce. And, and other companies are watching this. And they are doing, they're, they're coming alongside. And Roy's been a, a great catalyst for a lot of these companies. So I think about what God is doing. And, and, and <clears throat> it's amazing to watch and just be part of it. And, to, and, and how easy it is. So one thing I do encourage folks is, is do not be ashamed of the gospel because the stigma is there, but it's actually, you know, people, we think it's this impenetrable wall and you can't talk about faith, but actually I think it's paper thin and I think you can almost blow it away. And you do that with a, a question of love, which is, what's your faith background, you know? And I think about these different people in my life. I think all of us can be different characters in this story. You might be the karate teacher who just simply is a pillar of Jesus his whole life, so much so that years later I thought of him. Maybe that's you in somebody's life. Maybe they're going to remember, oh, so-and-so goes to church. I'll text her. I'll text him. They might remember you. So, so do not think that all the seeds that you plant go to waste. They, they do seed in people, so don't stop that. Uh, maybe you are my Auntie Jean, and you're going to do something really bold. You know, I asked her in that call, why did you call me right now? 
And she said, remember when Missy died? Missy was, was her daughter who died of an aneurysm um, decades before. And she said, that night, I felt like I was supposed to call her. And I didn't. And I vowed that if I ever felt like that again, I would obey. And I felt like that tonight. And so I think we have to be discerning. We have to be asking, who am I supposed to call? Who am I supposed to reach out to? And then simply obey, no matter how stupid you look, no matter how um, strange you feel, right? I mean, be delicate, be respectful, but um, we have to be asking, who, what am I supposed to do for you today? And that's kind of how I, I live every day now. Um, because I know who my CEO is, as Mike said, you know, work as for the Lord. He's my, that's, that's who I work for. I work for God, and I have the privilege of, of a really cool job that I get to uh, minister to people all day long and encourage them. And so I ask for my marching orders every day, you know, what, what, what do you have for me today? What do you need from me today? How can I help you? And something comes clear, like, oh, solve this problem, talk to this person. And so I, that's another thing I encourage in terms of a, a to-do is, you know, ask, taking, certainly taking the time to pray, but asking, you know, what, what am I to do today for you? And I ask, you know, what's my daily bread today? Um, and he'll always tell me. And it's bold and sometimes it's uncomfortable, uh, but, but it really does change things. We've had, um, you know, just all sorts of, because we, you can talk about it now, people do ask questions. And you can have these amazing conversations. Um, I just want to, you know, end with a, a piece of scripture and a quote. Um, the scripture is Revelation 3.20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, what is it? I will come in and dine with you and you with me. So he is knocking all the time and pursuing us. He will not stop pursuing us. And we simply have to listen for that knock and then open the door and have a relationship. He's willing to do that with us and he'll kind of instruct us on what to do. Um, and the last thing is a quote from C.S. Lewis who wrote Narnia and all these you know, wonderful Christian books that really helped me understand Christianity. And he says, there's only two groups of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. We have to make a decision it's either God's will or our will. And he'll let us. He let me have my will for decades. He will let us. He's a gentleman. He will let us. He will not force us to come to him. Um, but I, that's something I want to leave us with, is making that decision and then obeying the, that, the tasks that he has for us because he will bless them. And I just thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.